Welcome to City Cinematheque, where the art and pleasure of the movies are the subject of serious discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach film studies at the City College of the City University of New York. Today, we're going to be looking at a 1968 film from the Ukraine, The Eve of Ivan Kupolo, directed by Yuri Ilyinko. Now, this film is part of the so-called poetic Ukrainian cinema. It's exuberantly inventive and full of the images of Ukrainian folklore. It's also based upon a short story by Nikolai Gogol. We'll be talking about that and a great deal else after today's screening. Joining us will be Dr. Tony Anemone, a noted expert on the Slavic cinemas of the 1960s and 70s. Now, get ready for an explosion of cinema in The Eve of Ivan Kupolo. Welcome back to City Cinematheque. I'm just gonna start by saying, wow. This is a film that I think is overwhelming in any number of ways, in its invention, in its presentation of Ukrainian culture, um, <laughs> and ways I can't even, in a certain sense, initially describe. So we've got a lot to talk about in the next 30 minutes. And it's a pleasure to, in, to have back on City Cinematheque, Dr. Tony Anemone, who has recently retired from his position uh, teaching uh, Slavic and Russian history and film at uh, the New School uh, and is, has been writing for many years on the subject of these cinemas and is in the process of working on a monograph on Kalatazov, a very important uh, director uh, of the period we're talking about. Uh, here and we'll get and we'll get to that. Welcome back to City Cinematheque, Tony. Thanks very much, uh, Jerry. It's great to be back. Great. So let's begin with two w with two key figures, and then we'll put this in a little bit of context. So there's source materials for this film, and so what are those source materials, and why are they important? Well, the movie is based on a short story from Nikolai Gogol's first collection of stories. He's a you know very important Ukrainian Russian writer from the uh, first half of the 19th century. <clears throat> um, he comes from Ukraine, but he wrote in Russian, but his Russian is filled with Ukrainian words, with Ukrainian phrases, so it's a, it's a real mix, uh, mix of these things. And um, his early stories often deal with folkloric topics, devils, um, you know, Ukrainian villages, um, village life, ordinary people, this kind of early, you know, sort of turn to the folk, turn to a kind of popular culture, the first half of the 19th century. And this one story, uh, The Evening on the, the uh, Eve of St. John, uh, St. John's Day, is one of these kind of devil stories. Um, right. Basically, the, you know, the, the movie tells the basic story uh, that Gogol uses, um, uh, but Gogol is interested in lots of other things other than this devil worship story. Right. You okay. Know, this sort of love go that goes bad, and this, uh, and the tragic uh, results of of uh, you know of the main heroes turning to the devil. Um, Gogol is interested in things like language and the very act of telling a tale and the notions mm -hmm. of publishing works versus oral story oral stories. All this kind of stuff is really central to Gogol. That kind of stuff is left out of the movie. Right. And the movie really focuses on this central story of these two characters and this devil figure um, and what happens from there. Right. So, uh, Yuri Ilyenko, the director. So let's give a little bit of background on him and why he would be choosing this as the kind of, of work he's going to he's going to, you know, obviously devote considerable attention to. This is not a film made over a weekend. This is an extraordinary, you know, production. So why would it be important for him to use this? Who is he and why would he be choosing this material? So Elenko is a young man at this time. He's in his 20s. Um, he had finished uh, his education at the Central uh, Cinema School in Moscow, of Geek, um, where all of the famous Russian directors have studied. Um, and he, uh, he studied as a cameraman, so his, his, he started his career as a cinematographer. Um, his first big movie was doing the cinematography for the early masterpiece by Sergei Parajanov called Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors. He was the cinematographer on this film, and this is a really striking film that really strikes the first blow for a kind of cinematic nationalism in Soviet cinema. Okay. Um, it's a film that it's, and, and uh, by working with Parajanov, Ilyenko clearly learned a lot and was very influenced by Parajanov's turn to um, a kind of 19th century or sort of a 
slightly mythologized folk uh, figures. Ukrainian folk figures. Ukrainian folk Ukrainian figures, right. yes, exactly. Um, and, um, you know, Gogol, to turn to Gogol makes sense because Gogol was the most famous writer um, of this period, and certainly from Ukraine. But he was also a Russian classic, so that he's someone who could appeal to the uh -huh. Ukrainian culture, but also his works are known by the Russian readers and really, you know, most Soviet readers. If you go to school in the Soviet Union, you would read Gogol. So this was already a built-in kind of brand for, uh, for the director. Um, and there are all sorts of thematic and other reasons as well that uh, we could get into. Well, and, and uh, we've, we've talked at other points on, on uh, City Cinematheque about the use of uh, classic literary works that are established and are part of a national canon. And so, you know, under the conditions of uh, state-owned um, mm -hmm. cinemas, if you go to a canonical work, then you've... You've, you've, you've leaped over an initial problem with, with censorship, and then you can start creating, or if you want to prefer, messing with the text in particular ways to shape it towards uh, some things that may not be the canonical interpretation. Right. No, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, Russian culture and Soviet culture was really focused on the word on literature. And it's true that someone like Gogol, someone like Tolstoy, someone like Pushkin would basically give you an entree, would make it much easier to deal with the censorship issues. Um, uh, so that was, that is totally, you know, totally, um, you know, totally right for, for, yeah. uh, the, for these characters. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, let's, let's put this also in, a, in another context, and that is of th this, the, the broader because this is, this is a film made in the 1960s when Ukraine is part of the Soviet I Union and you, and you have all of these, um, you know, other places. You have, you know, Ka Kazakhstan, you have, etc. Et and so there's always this tension of the nationalism within the presumed, the presumed Union. But if we go back to, you know, the consolidation of Stalinism in the 1930s, there's an official aesthetic and it's called socialist realism. So put this, there's a couple of contexts we can put this film in, but put this film in the context of what was socialist realism and how this film, if I may use my best English, sure ain't socialist realism. Right. So, yes. Um I mean, the first thing I guess I would say is that even before Stalin and before Stalinism and socialist realism, there was this turn away from ethnic nationalism okay. to a kind of internationalism. In the 1920s, the Soviet Union, you know, in all spheres of the Soviet Union, the official ideology was we are now Soviet people and our job is to overcome the nationalist differences that have plagued our land and kept us apart and kept us at war for all these centuries. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, as you say, the official style of socialist realism, and one can say even more generally, Soviet cinema had evolved a very specific um, stylistic and thematic qualities by the time, by the beginnings of the 1960s, the period we we're talking about. And um, a movie like this, yes, absolutely rejects it. So let's talk about some of the ways um, that it rejects and it moves beyond. Um, well, clearly, as I said, you know, as we started saying, the turn to the Ukrainian village, the complicated mix of Russian and Ukrainian that, are, that the people speak, all of these things are, are turned away from internationalism and towards a more sort of ethnic, a more specific um, uh, popular culture. Right. Um, and of course, the Soviet Union was full of all of these places where, <laughs> you know, the same thing was happening. But in Ukraine at this point, you had a couple of movie directors of genius um, who were able to bring this out in cinema, and Ilyenko is one of them. So in terms of the movie itself, um, there are... Well, one can say, you know, we can talk about any number of things. One is um, the explosion of color, uh -huh. the, um, the focus on music, on f uh, and often on folk music, that these uh, things are sort of the first giveaways that this is not Soviet, this is not a Soviet, Soviet film. The fact that there are no political, there's no political or social themes that are, mm -hmm. that are in here, which of course was central to Soviet cinema. Um, the fact that there is this supernatural, and by the end of the movie, there is this strong religious element to this film. This, of course, would be lacking in, so in Soviet um, cinema of this period. 
Um, and if one moves from those kinds of markers to things like the general construction of the movie. Yeah, the Soviet okay. movies and socialist realism were all based on a narrative. And not only was the narrative tendentious in the sense that it would, it would show you something about society and, and politics that would fit into the dominant um, sort of political ideology, but also they were made to be followed. They were made to be <laughs> understood. The narrative was linear. The characters were, were treated from a kind of psychological viewpoint, psychological and political. Movies like this, as we've all just seen, are nothing about sort of about narrative linearity, right? It's all very discontinuous, it's all very associative, it's all very, you know, it's hard to figure out exactly what is going on at certain, po certain points. The moments of special effects, the moments of playing with filters and colors and, and the mobile camera, sort of ex very expressive camera, all of these things, um, of course, we, you know, you can find examples of them in Soviet movies in, sure. the, in, in recent years starting in the 1950s, but they were still, I think, perceived as an absolute rejection of the overall aesthetics of socialist realism. At the right. And, and we need to point out, because I've not said it yet, we haven't d discussed it, uh, these films by Ilyinko were suppressed. That, that is, they, they, it is they, they were released before the fall of the Soviet Union, but in that period of perestroika. Uh, several of his films were, uh, he was allowed to continue filmmaking for a while, but uh, several of the films were held. Uh, and again, it's, it's that uh, difficult situation that these kinds of national cinemas or national centers, uh, ethnic centers, going, going to Ukraine, uh, in, in that, that you've invested, and, and when you have a film like this, you've invested a lot of state resources into making a film like this. So if you, if you make the film and the censors say, we don't think so, so do you throw away that investment? Or what was more commonly, thank goodness, you just right. put it on the shelf right. to wait for the winds to blow in different in different directions. So this is an example of a film that's now not so well known in the West, um, but has been available for some 30 years. But for the first 50, 20 years of its existence, it was known to filmmakers in Ukraine um, and a few others in those circles, but was not uh, widely distributed. So, right, I mean, censorship is an absolutely central question talking about Soviet cinema um, in any period. Right. Um, in the 1960s, perhaps it's a little more complicated, a little, or perhaps I should say a little more nuanced. Okay. These movies were, in fact, released. You know, there was, there was not much, uh, there was, they were released in very limited numbers. Right. And then they disappeared from the, from the screens. And again, in the Soviet Union, they didn't have a strong culture of sort of repertoire theaters where you would show movies right. from the past. Um, but they were, you know, they're all of the important directors of the 1960s. And if you think about Parajanov, Tarkovsky, the Russian, and Ilyenko, the Ukrainian, and these are three filmmakers who are absolutely central to the sort of turn away from socialist realism right. towards a more nationalist inflected, but also a more aesthetic and a more religious sort of type of cinema, or perhaps existential or philosophical type of cinema is better. Um, all of them had serious problems with the censors. Right. But most of their movies were seen. They were yeah. shown briefly, at least. And what's interesting about Ilyenka, you know, there is this, um, you know, he, as I said, he was someone who, who struggled with the censor. But the movie that I think came out after this one, his most famous movie, The White Bird with a Black Mark, Correct. actually won the main um, uh, prize at the Moscow Film Festival in 1971. So this is, so this is, you know, this gives you a sense that these movies were perhaps more what we would call art house movies. Right. They would be shown at some festivals and some particular locations, but not in certainly not in broad um, release. And in the Soviet Union, most movies actually ended up on. TV pretty soon. And that was where most people saw these movies, and these movies I don't think were shown on TV. So there's yeah. this kind of back and forth with censorship. Right, 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 right. Well, so let's go back into the, the folkloric aspects of, the, uh, of this film. I mean, I think there's, first of all, to, to say up, 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 up front, this is a film that is a film of many parts, and not all the relationships between all the parts 
are clear even after multiple uh, multiple multiple screenings and you've already you know addressed that it's not not merely non-linear but there's a puzzle aspect to this that the film is made up of striking scenes and there are questions still about what is the relationship between uh, certain scenes so uh, there's a portion of this film that follows very much as you've already said the arc of the original story and then there's some stuff as it were and we'll, we'll detail what it is that is really not in the story but is very much in ukrainian culture and ukrainian in ukrainian history so let's let's first of all you know deal with deal with the arc and 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 and, and, and that world um first of all th there is this question of where uh, we know where this is taking place it's taking place in a ukrainian uh, village but but the interesting question is when um, because the, the film doesn't, uh, you know, I I is interested in a, a kind of mythical past that cannot be exactly in, enumerated, chrono, you know, chron right. chron chrono chr chronologically. Right. So, what, what do you think of this? The, the image, Tony, of the of the village and what we're being told by this image of the village. Right. So, well, it's interesting. If you think of the go, if you look back at the Gogol short story, yeah. you get this sense uh, in, the, in the frame to the story, there are people talking and they talk about, oh, you know, grandparents telling stories and people in the old days. Yeah. So one has the sense that, you know, things happened a generation ago when, when old folks were young. Um, so if the story was published in the 1820s, this would put us somewhere in the 1780s or yeah, something okay. at that point. Um, but of course, you know, neither the movie nor the, or neither the story nor the movie really have anything to do with history. Well, yeah, okay, yeah, good, good. So <laughs> it is this highly <laughs> mythological version. And it's interesting, you know, there's, um, you'll see this in Gogol and you'll see this in Ilyet in Ilyenko as well, that is, um, people are kind of performing as Ukrainians. There, there's this sort of performance of Ukrainian popular culture. So they dress up as Ukrainians, their homes are all painted in the way that, you know, Ukrainian villages or Ukrainian uh, huts are, 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 are decorated. Um, and they're always dancing and drinking and, you know, there's this sort of element which is, you know, not really very serious uh, as a, as a, as a representation of what life was like in the old days in, 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 in Ukraine. Yet I think that was also a way that filmmakers were able to, so I don't want to say smuggle in, but to work themes right. of national selfhood into these movies because that was seen as not serious. That was kind of a cliche. Um, and I think we see some of that here. I, I think that, you know, to a certain extent, when one looks at this movie, the entire, the entire plot is kind of an excuse for the oh. last 15 minutes of the movie, um, where things, as you've suggested, you know, things change drastically. I mean, there's this familiar story, there are some cool effects, there are some moments of humor, there's, there are all of these sort of cinematic elements which make that first you know, two quarters or three quarters of the movie sort of fun to watch, interesting. Um, but the movie is not really about um, a devilish figure who, no. you know, will make your wishes come true if you will commit some terrible crime, right? It's really about other stuff. Um, and I think that that's, you know, that that is in a, in a sense sort of saves the movie from being seen as this condescending portrait of traditional Ukrainian popular culture, which I think some, some viewers today might be, um, might object to. Well, and this comes back to another one of the, of, of, of the context that we haven't really mentioned yet, which, which is the fact that these filmmakers and somebody like Ilyenko, clearly, uh, they are cosmopolitans. Uh, they have, on the one hand, there's a deep dedication to the national culture of Ukraine. Yet, on the other hand, uh, at this particular moment, this is an exuberant moment in European in European cinema, uh, and there there is a way in which narrative form cinematic codes are being all broken down across and by a number of brilliant d d directors. Uh, and I'll I'll mention, for example, in this case, Fellini and this whole notion of the circus and the celebration of Italian culture and a breaking away from linear narratives through this kind of spectacle that, just as you were saying, uh, is at the same time, it's, it's 
whimsical and it's and it's fun, yet it's using archetypes and is addressing Italianness. So there's a way in which right. Ilyenko kind of you know folds into a lot of things that are happening um, you know elsewhere and and um, happening in, in cinemas we regard as, as largely a Western European phenomenon. Right. No, that's absolutely correct. Um, the 1960s, when this is happening, is a period even in the Soviet Union of vast sort of change as revolutionary changes in many aspects of life in cinema as much as anything. Um, so I guess I would say that the origin of these movies really comes from the 1920s sort of uh. Ukrainian poetic, poetic cinema that's founded by Dovzhenko, the famous Dovzhenko, right. his most famous movie called Earth. That, um, these, this movie could not exist without that. that Correct. Is, this turn to nature, this sort of, this... Um, this very idyllic vision of a world uh, which is insulated from the horrors of political, contemporary political life, where people can be themselves. And this world is usually, is, you know, it, the, 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 the contemporary world, the world of politics and violence intrudes on this sort of paradise. And that's kind of, you know, one of the sort of paradigms of this, of this traditional Ukrainian cinema. By the time you get to, you know, and of course everyone, any filmmaker in the Soviet Union would know these films backwards and forwards, of and course. especially a Ukrainian. Um, but in the 1960s, as you, as you suggest, um, these filmmakers do have access to, or they're beginning to see movies from the late 50s and the early 60s by European filmmakers. I would say um, not only Fellini, but also the French New Wave. Absolutely really, the case. Yeah. Um, is going on here. So these are people who are now sort of taking these um, and this is true of Parajanov, this is true of Tarkovsky um, and Ilyenka. They are taking these new ways of imagining movies, the rejection of a kind of standard realism, the rejection of a sort of a movie which says the audience should suspend disbelief and believe in the reality of what's happening on the screen. No, these movies are all about artifice, they're all about convention, they're all about showing and telling the viewers at all moments that they are watching a movie, they are watching some kind of artistic construction uh, um, and that they have to interpret it. In, you know, right, yes. Way. They can't forget themselves. Um, so there are, so there, you know, there, there are many specifics about the editing, about the camera work that you know, one can sort of trace to European in um, cinema. One can also say that um, Ilyenka's teacher, uh, his cinematography professor at, um, at film school, was actually the great um, cinematographer uh, Urusevsky, who was mm -hmm. one of the first sort of pioneers of the expressive camera, of using, of using um, a, an awful lot of of filters in order to sort of create this dramatic and emotional feeling in the film. Um, and much of, when one looks at this film, um, one can see the influence of his, of his teachers. You know, the, as in every, as in every right. sort of artistic movement, things start before you see them. And, and if you look at Urusevsky's movies in the 50s and even in the 40s, you can see the beginnings of this. But it's coming to fruition in the 1960s in, in these sorts of filmmakers. So there are, um, at least these sort of three um, uh, sort of influences. One is the sort of traditional Ukrainian school, the other is sort of European New Wave, and I guess the third one I would say is the other filmmakers like Tarkovsky and Parajan. Right, of, of, of the generation, yes. Of that, yeah, they're a few years older, yeah. but they are essentially this generation of the 60s. And I'm not sure if you mentioned that Ilyenko was the cinematographer on Par Parajanov's yeah. first very famous yeah. movie, Shadows. Yeah, of uh, which we have been able to include in our, in, in our series. Oh, so, wonderful. So, yeah. so, so, so um, let's talk about the, the we, we've talked about the first three quarters of the film. But then all of a sudden, you know, there's the trajectory. There's the, the arc of, of, of Petr and of, you know, him selling his soul, uh, what happens, the depletion of, of, of him, and he's reduced to ashes. And then he's reduced to ashes, and you say, well, where does the film go from here? And I don't think any sort of normal viewer would say, oh, well, it's going to go to barbarian Tartars on horses or whatever. So what do you make right. of this last quarter or third of the film and, and, and where Ilyenko is going? Because he's clearly off the map from Gogol here. Totally. Um, <clears throat> So there are, if you, if you look carefully at those last 15 minutes, there are three separate parts. Yeah. The first one is this weird kind of image of 
you know, Catherine the Great visiting Ukraine, the Crimea. Uh, this is a, a historic a, occasion um, in 1787, I think was the year. Mm -hmm. And the story, which I think has been seriously exaggerated, is that her her chief of staff, Pachomkin, sort of set up these sort of perfect villages for her to ride by, and she would see, and she would she would think that people were were wealthy, people yeah. were doing well in this yeah. area. So it was high. It was to hide the poverty and the reality of the Ukra of life in the Ukraine for the new empress, and we see that played out. This extremely conventional scene. Um, uh, the carriage going by, she's kind of like a puppet in the yeah. arm of Pachomkin, and then on the back of her coachman, there's a mirror. So you get the sense of she can only see herself, she can't really see the world outside her. So it's, a, and, and you see this, these, the, the completely flat facades of these fake homes. Mm -hmm. she, uh, Catherine asks, you know, why aren't people singing and dancing? So they play out this yes. sort of thing. Um, so it's this sort of play action instead of reality. And that can not, can only make Ukrainians and make even Soviets think of the history of Russian sort of imperialism in this part of the world. Absolutely. The kind of military conquest and the, you know, the refusal to really see the people who are being colonized. Um, so we start off with this sort of image of historical imperialism. The second scene is, again, completely separate. We see Pidorka with what appears to be the ashes of her husband, but really looks like it's a baby. Yeah, absolutely. In swaddling clothes, right? Um, and she is chased by Tartar ho horsemen in the open steppe somewhere in, um, you know, in Crimea or Ukraine. Uh, eventually, they, they catch her. Uh, and then there's a cut, and we see, you know, the next morning she wakes up. So there, so this image, what is this image? We have a woman with a sort of, a, a, you know, apparently a baby who is being chased by these foreign invaders, and then there's the, the moment of violence and rape apparently is cut, and we don't see that. We see the next day. Um, and this is, again, a, a sort of a, you know, an image which is very, can be very meaningful to people. There is this image of women, mothers, victimization by foreign invaders that, um, you know, one can, one can see that uh, in general, but if one thinks specifically about Andrei Rublev, Tarkovsky's very, very famous movie, which is critically important in this sort of new nationalism in the cinema, um, there are scenes very similar to this. The kind of the cinematography of this scene is also sort of part of this. So you get this image of victimization. We're gonna, uh, give, me, give me 30 seconds or so on the third scene. And the third words. scene is basically this sort of enigmatic turn to religion. We're in some sort of church or monastery uh, and people are calling for a miracle. So you have the sense that we have the sort of the three parts or the sort of historic history of imperialism, the kind of symbolical victimization of the Ukraine in the second part. Um, and the third part is perhaps a solution that is some kind of religious miracle, miracle that, will, that okay. will solve the problem, something of that sort. Well, well we're going to end on a miracle, OK? <laughs> <laughs> if you've enjoyed our discussion uh, here, I hope you're going to come back to CUNY TV for uh, other things that we show, both on City Cinematheque and on the station. If you'd like to know more about that, please visit our website. That's www.tv.cuny.edu. There you're going to find information about City Cinematheque and the rest of our programming, which is 24 times 7. So visit www.tv.cuny.edu. Tony, thank you for a wealth of information, interpretation, thought. It's a rich film. And I think we mined a little bit of it, but there's a lot more to do. Thanks very much, Jerry. Okay, Great good. Great. And I look forward to having you back once again right. on City Cinematheque. Thank you for joining us today on City Cinematheque. And I hope you'll join us again in further occasions as we continue our stroll through the archives of film history. But for now, it's goodbye. <laughs>